Good morning. This is Pastor Dennis Roser. Welcome to Divine Service at St. John's Lutheran Church. The members of St. John's are committed to sharing the good news of Christ Jesus, who was crucified in the place of sinners, so that everyone who believes and trusts in Him will not perish, but receive as a free gift everlasting life. St. John's is located at 1000 Bluff Street in Beloit. Our telephone number is 608-362-8595. Please visit our website at www.stjohnsbeloit.com. We are a member congregation of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Our Sunday morning worship service is held every week at 9 o'clock a.m. And we invite you to join us and receive the gifts that God delights in giving you through His Son. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who may heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept the record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking His grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in His mercy, has given His Son to die for you, and for his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us pray. O Lord, keep your church with your perpetual mercy, and because of our frailty, we cannot but fall. Keep us ever by your help from all things hurtful, and lead us to all things profitable to our salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our reading from the Holy Gospels is taken from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. On another occasion, as Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, he was passing along the border between Samaria and Galilee. When he entered a certain village, ten men with leprosy met him. Standing at a distance, they called out loudly, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. As they went away, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet, thanking him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus responded, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give glory to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go your way. Your faith has saved you. I
In the name of Jesus, amen. For many people, maybe even a majority of people, 2020 will be remembered as one of the worst years, if not the worst year of their lives. Many people lost loved ones to COVID-19. Many people lost their jobs, their businesses, their livelihoods. A whole host of medical professionals worked and worked well beyond the point of exhaustion for days and days and months on end, many times being quarantined from their families. Many people in nursing facilities lived in isolation, being locked down, as it was called, into their rooms, receiving nursing attention and their meals brought in, but otherwise being confined within the walls of their apartments. Families being unable to see family members during this time. And worst of all, perhaps, and you've all heard the stories, you know the people, people who died in a hospital room without their family, as their families were in the parking lot, sitting in their cars, crying their eyes out, unable to be physically present with their loved one in their last moments. We know the harrowing stories of how hard life during the pandemic has been for so many people and how brutal that time was and perhaps continues. It is with this mindset that I would ask you to consider leprosy in the ancient world. Yes, it was in a certain degree a skin condition, but it was so much more. It was sociological. It was economic. It was to be numbered among those who are still living, even though they are dead. Leprosy in the ancient world was a permanent, a permanent situation like what we experienced during the pandemic. If you had leprosy, you had to live apart from your family. You may never see your family again, maybe from a distance once in a while, but that would be as close as it gets. And you would suffer physically as it began to deaden and deaden more of your nerves and that parts of your body began to erode and go away. You couldn't enter into the towns. You were simply stuck many times among the cemeteries is where they would go, among the tombs seeking shelter. It was one of the only places where they could be. And so your life was over, but the painful reality is that you weren't dead yet, and that that might take quite a while in coming. And so you can imagine the situation of these ten men who encounter Jesus as he travels along the border between Galilee and Samaria. Galilee is north of Samaria, so they're traveling either east or they're traveling west. But as they travel, they encounter ten men outside of a village. Now, they weren't able to enter into any walled village or any city like that, but they might be able to come around the outskirts and beg for some food, get scraps from the garbage dumps, perhaps. And they see Jesus, and they cry out to him, Lord, Master, have mercy on us. And Jesus says to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. It's you and me, we say, Okay, um, what's that supposed to do? Now, for those who understand the Old Testament, and I'm sure that at least nine of these guys, given what we know and what we'll see about them, it meant go and be examined of your leprosy. This was the first step to resuming your life, and very, very few people were ever able to take that step. Leprosy doesn't go away, but there were cases in which there was misdiagnosis 
another skin condition presenting itself like leprosy. And a person was able to go and be examined by the priest and return to their life. But with people with straight up leprosy, they weren't going back. But Jesus go, says, go and show yourselves to the priests. We read probably the fullest treatment of leprosy and how it works in Leviticus 13 and 14. In both chapters, it says that one must be approved by the priest who will examine the spot where the leprosy has been. And if he determines the person to be clean, then they undergo eight days of ritual washings and other offerings that they make, and they're delighted to do so because they're getting their lives back. And so Jesus says to them, start the process. Start the process of entering back into your lives. Have your life back. And so they start off. Now they don't know. They don't know for sure if they're going to be cleansed, but they're in the kind of desperate situation in which they don't have a lot of other things that they can be doing. What else can they do? And so they give it a try. They give it a try. They go on towards Jerusalem, where the priests will be. And as they go, we don't know how far away from Jesus, but as they go, they are cleansed. One of them, we are told, turns back, and in a loud voice gives glory to God and falls face down before Jesus in worship, thanking him from what is, for what has happened. He has his life back. The other nine also have their lives back. And Jesus says to the man, says to the man, we're not ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? Was only this man found to return and give thanks to God? And Luke tells us in parentheses, this guy was a Samaritan, because Jesus says, no one else but this foreigner? And then he says to the man, get up, rise, go your way, for your faith has saved you, for your faith has delivered you. Imagine his family, imagine his family when he shows up on the doorstep. He's been dead to them for who knows how long, never expecting to see him again, there he is on the doorstep cleansed. And perhaps any appendages that have been removed are now restored also. He is whole and he is able to live again among his people and in his life. He was dead and now he lives again. But the other nine, the other nine who we are, I think, tempted to think badly about. We think, how ungrateful, how ungrateful. If this was their situation and they suddenly have their lives handed back to them, they don't take a moment, they don't take a moment to go back and praise God and thank Jesus. I would like to suggest that we are not, we ourselves, are not unlike them. What's going on here is the gateway. They might be healed, but the gateway to rejoining the living, seeing their families again, taking up their vocations, being restored to life, the gateway is the priests. Jesus says, go and show yourselves to the priests. I believe that it's simply a matter of of their eagerness, their eagerness to return to their normal lives, overcome by joy, and yes, I would think gratitude, that causes them to neglect turning back to God and giving thanks. Are they awful people? Yeah, they're awful people. They're sinners. And so are we. Can any of us say that never, Never does our preoccupation with the things of this life get in the way of our relationship with God, get in the way with our thinking about the things of God. I suspect that all of us knows what it's like to have the busyness 
and the distractions of our day-to-day worlds almost cause us to forget God. We don't worship as we ought or as frequently. We don't pray daily as we ought. Are we in our Bibles as frequently? The very way in which God communicates to us through His Spirit is through the Word of God. And are we studying that Word of God? Or are we more like the nine who plunge on towards the priests than the Samaritan who goes back and gives glory to God and thanks Jesus? Something that's important for us to notice. We who are preoccupied to the things of this life such that the most trivial things will cause us to be distracted from God and the things of God. That we see the nine who have been healed continue to be healed. If it were any other Circumstance, Luke would have told us this. But Jesus does not revoke. He does not revoke the healing. The nine, as they make their way to the temple, do not suddenly see that they are infected again with leprosy. That Jesus is fine. You're not going to come back and give glory to God and thank me? Have your leprosy back. He does not do that. While this passage reveals a whole lot about us and our sinful hearts, even more so does it reveal the heart of God, our Heavenly Father, that even though we deserve His punishment, bestows on us His grace, meaning the very things that we don't deserve. Those nine, those nine, went to the priest's And we have every reason to believe because Jesus, when he heals, he heals where to the priest's surprise and amazement clean and went home. Just as the Samaritan's family were surprised to find him on their doorstep, nine other families, nine other households were amazed to see their loved one who had been dead return to life. And so do you say to yourself, you say to yourself, well, then I guess really, they're not any worse off for their ingratitude. Not in the sense of punishment, no. But what have they missed? What have they missed? They have missed sharing the joy of this miracle with the one who performs the miracle. Having him share in their delight and in their joy. This didn't happen for them. It was the case with the Samaritan, but it doesn't happen with them. So many times we get angry with people who we believe only know us when they need something. That sure, if if they need to to borrow some money, or if they need us to fix something, or maybe to haul something in our pickup truck, whatever the case may be, then suddenly they come around. And we don't necessarily have great feelings about them, do we? That's the way it is. When we approach God in our prayer lives, as if we are approaching Him through the speaker outside of the drive through at a fast food restaurant. When our prayer lives consist solely upon letting God know what we need Him to do, and we try to be helpful about it, we not only tell Him what the problem is, we tell Him how to solve it, but that when our prayer lives lack thanks and praise, lack simply talking to God, about these things. There's not a fullness of relationship there. It is transactional, like our relationship with the people who work the drive-through at McDonald's. It goes no deeper. And who loses 
in this? Who loses in this? Us. We have a doctrine called the aseity of God. It's a fancy word which means God is completely sufficient in and of himself. God is not lonely. God is three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they have lived in mutual love for all eternity. God, the insanity of God, this doctrine can be simply spelled out in this way, God doesn't need you. God doesn't need you, and he certainly doesn't need me. And so the one who loses, when we look to God as simply someone under which to engage in transactions. God, do this for me because I need this. We are the ones who lose because we do not know the fullness of a relationship with God. And what's more, and what's more, if those guys, those other nine, didn't come to believe that Jesus is the very God of the very God. What good was it? Yeah, they live on in peace and normalcy a few more years. That's it. That's it. You notice, ten were healed, but we only know that one man was saved, and that's the Samaritan that returned. Jesus says, your faith has saved you or your faith has delivered you. You can translate that word either way. And and really, I don't want to talk about translation this morning because we had the fruit of the Spirit and I lost major points in epistles class for translating it as fruits, plural. But I'm not bitter. It's 20-some years ago, but it can be translated, your faith has delivered you or your faith has saved you. You see, we can have all the things in this life, even having God grant all of our requests. But if we lack faith that his son has died in our place and answered for our sins, we lack salvation. This is why when we do acts of mercy for people, we also share with them the gospel. We don't want to simply fill bellies and clothe bodies that are going to be lost on the last day. But the fullness of God's relationship is such that even though we deserve only punishment, he extends mercy. We have acted just like those nine. Ingratitude. Ingratitude is our M.O. in this life towards God, if we're honest. And yet, what do we read in Ephesians 2? But that while we were dead in trespasses, Christ Jesus was given to die for us. You have not worshipped God as you ought, and neither have I. But God is not going to revoke your blessings. But in fact, delights in giving to you and me the very things we don't deserve. Complete forgiveness and eternal life through his Son. He bids you come, to come back to him, and to enjoy the depths of and the fullness of a relationship with God, a God who is the giver, and you, simply, the receiver. For that is how the grace of God works. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please join me in praying the prayer taught by the Savior. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for listening today, and may the gifts of God in Christ Jesus be granted to you by His gracious will. Almighty God, the Father and the Son 
and the Holy Spirit bless you now and forever.